So I just like to invite you to um, find a posture that is going to be really comfortable for the next half hour. Um, and if you prefer, feel free to um, shut your camera off. Whatever is going to <clears throat> maximize the possibility of um, of just really being able to be with be with the body that you have at this moment, the mind that you have at this moment, and really appreciating the support that we give to and get from each other when we when we come together to to sit. So I will ring a bell to start and to stop and I'll do a little gentle guiding at the beginning. And as the sound of the bell fades, just gently bring the attention into the body. Just feeling yourself sitting or even lying down. The Buddha talked about this fathom long body as a great teacher. We learn so much just by being with this body. So feel yourself taking your place in community. And in mindfulness practice, we become aware of the present moment's experience just as it is. Experience of mind, experience of body, as best we can without judgment, without clinging or pushing away. And I would encourage you to bring your whole self to this experience, not needing to keep out or compartmentalize. There's sometimes a tendency, <clears throat> excuse me, just to sort of let the meditator show up. And I would just encourage you to invite your whole self into the present moment's experience. And see if it's possible to be here just with a uh, receptive, welcoming awareness. Letting go of any idea of what counts as a good meditation, letting go of any striving to get it right. But just cultivating a trust in awareness itself
So just sitting or lying with an attitude of kindliness, of gentle curiosity, just allowing ourselves to be with whatever arises and passes away. Seeing if it's possible to trust ourselves. to trust awareness.
Well, happy to see you here and taking a, um, a leaf from Shelley's um, procedure. Let's just take a minute to stretch um, if you want. Stand up if you need to. Well, for people who have been here for a while um, on Wednesday night, Shelley has been focusing on the Buddha's um, Eightfold Path and um, focusing on it with the emphasis that the Buddha's teachings are all about understanding suffering and its causes, which really means that it's all about wisdom and compassion. And it's really wise to reflect on impermanence and the inevitability of death. And it's compassionate to do whatever we can, while we can, to alleviate the suffering that arises from greed and hatred and delusion. So tonight, I want to offer some thoughts on taking seriously the possibility of enormous environmental and social disruption and how we as students of the Dharma might see clearly and prepare ourselves to act wisely and compassionately. And this was really spurred by um, an essay that I, I read earlier this fall um, in October I had the great good fortune to go to the Rocky Mountain Ecodharma Center, which is um, sort of um, northwest of, of Boulder. Uh, it's at about at 8,500 feet. And I was there with my community Dharma um, cohort. Um, and we were um, reflecting on sort of the ethics involved in eco-dharma and how do we understand our responsibilities um, as practitioners in this um, in this world that is um, at such peril right now and I, I have to say that it was just um, it was such a beautiful sight and we were there at I said the most beautiful time of the year because the aspens were all gold and then the um, the conifers were dark green and you know we could see the um, the continental divide and see the snow on the continental divide from where we were I mean it was just this staggeringly beautiful remote site and to be there contemplating um, environmental destruction and disaster was just, there was something about um, the juxtaposition that was just piercing. And um, and not too far from there, if you remember last year, I think it was shortly after Christmas, just um, sort of to the north, I think it was like the northeast of Boulder, you know, there was a terrible fire that just within a matter of you know, hours consumed 2,000, not 2,000, 200 houses. I mean, that there was just a, a very prosperous community that was just totally wiped out by um, by a fire there. And um, you know, our our host there, who was one of our, our cohort, just reminded us that, you know, um, people in Boulder had just had this shock that a part of their community could just disappear to fire, you know, within a day that, the 200 homes just could burn so quickly because it had been so dry um, that year. So as we were there as a group, we were um, considering um, an essay, uh, and it was an essay called Ethical Maxims for a Marginally 
inhabitable planet. And it was not written by, um, by Buddhists. It was written by two retired bioethicists, uh, David Schenk and Larry Churchill. And it was published in uh, a journal that comes out of Johns Hopkins called Perspectives in Biology and Medicine. And it was published um, just last year. And the really uh, grounding premise of the essay is that the accelerating climate emergency will require an ethical response to unprecedented circumstances. And as clinical bioethicists who have had decades of experience focusing on care and what they called decision-making in catastrophic, life-threatening and um, life-threatening situations, they, in this essay, um, were urging the readers to adopt what they called the cultural equivalent of advanced directives, of thinking ahead about, um, about what to do in the face of catastrophe. And they said, any hope or mitigation, any hope of mitigation or adaptation or transitioning out of social collapse will require all the cognitive and emotional resources we have, minds and bodies all working with knowledge, in acknowledgement and in concert. And this um, brought to mind very quickly um, something that uh, Joanna Macy, who is one of my Dharma heroines, um, Joanna Macy is, um, is a Buddhist scholar, um, an eco-philosopher, um, an activist, and um, Joanna Macy recently said, and she is 93 years old, and I was on a webinar that she had earlier this year, and she said, if she could choose to be born in any period of human history, she would choose to be born right now because it is a time of immense crisis and peril. And she said, this is the time to show up. This is the time to, to be here and to work together. And um, Schenck and, and Churchill, the bioethicists, um, offer um, six maxims. And maxims are essentially short guides about how to act that can become habitual uh, practices. And that these maxims would sort of enable people to respond to crisis in an ethically um, appropriate way. And as I read them and as we discussed them as a, um, as a group of Dharma practitioners and teachers, um, it really seemed to us that they were congruent with our own Buddhist ethics and that they offer very tangibly um, a path for skillfully relating to a very volatile future in a practical and grounded way. So I'm gonna talk us through these six maxims. The first one is work hard to grasp the immensity. Work hard to grasp the immensity. And they talked about the possibility of environmental and social collapse is for most of us, you know, inconceivable if we've not been touched by this. And sometimes, um, you know, we think about non-delusion and the move is to despair, which is kind of a, a moral paralysis. But our practice, we, we hope, will enable us to see very, very clearly, um, and by seeing clearly to maximize the possibility of an ethically um, appropriate response. I mean, we can think about, I mean, one of the, the big examples was the um, what happened after Hurricane Katrina, you know, how, how that situation, which I would think was, you know, unimaginable um, that people could have been in such, could have been so abandoned by 
um, resources left to their own devices. And um, there's a, a, a searing um, book. Um, it, it's called Four Days at uh, Memorial. And it was also, I understand, made into an excellent movie. But it was about what happened in a hospital where the generators ceased, everything was flooded, they couldn't evacuate patients because they, it was an eight-story hospital. Um, you had to get down to the second floor to get to the garage, parking garage, where there was a heliport. And what they, after four days of no help from anyone, they evacuated as many people as they could. Um, there was a skeleton staff left at the hospital. And there were these um, desperately ill people um, in the hospital. And the doctor essentially made the choice to euthanize the patients who could not be um, evacuated. And this was a Catholic doctor and it, it's, it's very, and she was actually tried and found innocent. But it was this you know, situation that was unimaginable, that no one came to their aid, that she was left at, they were left with this skeleton staff and people that they could not get out of the hospital and had no resources, they had no electricity, and those patients were really suffering. And she decided that the, uh, that the, the uh, in this unimaginable situation, to end the suffering of her of her patients. I mean, that again is, you know, the sort of unimaginable situation. We can think, you know, this year in Pakistan, like a third of the country flooded. Millions and millions of people had to move. Um, you know, we can think about just this past week in Buffalo, you know, the city that is is made to deal with snow. I mean, that is no stranger to enormous amounts of snow that they get this storm that is called, you know, the once in a generation storm. So that, you know, we, we are much more likely to be faced with these sorts of extreme conditions and they are um, going to be happening more frequently. And, you know, it, it sort of seems inconceivable in, in a way. And I was thinking especially about this one, you know, work hard to grasp the immensity. And I thought about the story of the Buddha. You know, the story about the Buddha that he lives this very sequestered, very comfortable life. And at one point he decides, as the story goes, to uh, leave the palace where he'd been so protected from seeing how difficult things could be. And he's taken out and he sees old age, decrepit old age, he sees sickness and he sees death. And you know, if we um, take at least the, um, the sort of heart of the story, it is really about confronting a reality that he had never confronted before, that he had never really dealt with. And so I think, okay, so, the Buddha's, um, the sort of start of the Buddha's awakening was really to confront what, what previously had been unimaginable. His journey begins with that. The second maxim we have, work hard to, um, to grasp the immensity, to really take to heart, um, the, this very real possibility of immense social and environmental disruption. The second one is cultivate radical hope. And this is, um, um, he makes it, the authors make a reference to Joanna Macy's active hope. And they say that when the ordinary hope for the desired future has to be abandoned, the question is, what can be done that can make the situation better or even less awful? And they talk about, they said, as bioethicists, they were sometimes confronted with 
medical situations that were almost unimaginable. They talked about, for example, um, an, uh, a sort of condition that infants can be born with in which their bones just always break. They say just moving a child, um, picking up a child, the bones will break. And they, they talked about how, you know, for new parents, this is just, and for, for the whole staff, this is, um, you know, an almost inconceivable um, situation. And they said, you know, that in this, the question is, what can you do to make the situation less awful? This is what radical hope is. It's, it's not getting stuck on, it shouldn't be like this, the unfairness of it, but in any situation, is it possible to make things less awful, to make things better? And it's sometimes very simple things like being kind, not abandoning people, behaving with integrity, being with the people who are uh, suffering the most to bear. This is something that Bernie Glassman talked about, you know, with, um, with um, you know, bearing witness. Can you bear witness? Can you, can you be present? And, you know, this does make things less awful, but there is always, I said, there is uh, almost always, there is a way to make a situation less hot, less awful. And it's by being a decent human being, by showing up and being present. The third maxim is have a line in the sand. Be clear about what you will do and what you will not do. This is sort of an internal advanced directive, imagining the worst. For example, being resolved that you won't abandon um, someone, that you won't save yourself at the expense of others, that you won't hoard, that you will bear witness. It's really thinking about, you know, in cases of extremity, um, you know, what will I do? Will I save myself at any cost? And it's, um, you know, I, I think about um, when we do the, the five daily recollections, you know, I am of the nature to age, I'm getting old. I am of the nature to sicken, illness and infirmity await me. I am of the nature to die. My death approaches daily. And then there's the line that is the, the fourth recollection is all that is dear and delightful to me will be separated from me, will become otherwise. And I think about that as that's what, that's what I sort of, I need to take to heart. I need to be prepared that all that is dear and delightful to me, the world that I love, may be separated from me, will be otherwise. And that's when, then the last one is, you know, that, that we are the inheritors of our, um, our karma, the, of our past karma, the owners of our present karma, and the fabricators of our future karma. That when everything is separated from me, the only thing I have left is my action. My, my volitional action. So that's the third one. Have a line in the sand, have this sort of internal advanced directive. And the fourth is appreciate the astonishing and unique opportunity. And this is really consonant with Joanna Macy saying that she would choose to be alive at this time because it is such a critical time. So this is, um, the, the authors talk about, you know, in, in the midst of, of all this, be amazed at the interconnectedness of things, their astonishing complexity, 
we can appreciate being able to witness and participate. We still may appreciate um, nature, beauty, friendship, um, being able to work with others to, um, to relieve suffering. Now, this is when we can appreciate uh, Sangha. We can appreciate the support we give to and get each other. And I think about uh, Ram Das, the late Ram Das had this beautiful way of talking about experience. He said, you know, we're all just walking each other home. I mean, that's just a, that's just a very beautiful way to think about this. We're all just walking each other home. The fifth maxim is uh, train your body and mind. And um, I remember years ago reading about uh, a commander of, a, of the New York City SWAT teams. And he talked about um, one of the ways that he prepared for his job is he used to listen to recordings of, um, of sirens and he would practice breathing exercises while he listened to uh, recordings of sirens going off so that he, he was training himself to you know, sort of calm down and be present in the midst of, um, of, of all the, the chaos when you have a, a SWAT. So having this sort of somatic awareness that we, we have experience, we train ourselves to calm our bodies. Um, we train ourselves to be, um, be mindful in the, in the present moment. Um, so we're, we're training our, our minds, um, we train our, our bodies. Um, and one of the other things that they suggest, which is interesting, is um, to also um, shift, uh, shift time frames. You know, when we talk about appreciating the astonishing and unique opportunity, you know, I think about some of the um, photographs that we've seen from the the Webb telescope. Sometimes, you know, that sort of galactic um, sense of time and and space sometimes can be um, a refuge in in a way. I remember before I I started um, Buddhist practice um, when I was in my my 30s and I would go to the mountains in, in the summer and you know I would always feel this sense that there was this sort of geologic time because there were these these huge mountains out west and uh, and I just had this sense of okay they've been here for for so long and my life is just this teeny teeny tiny speck but somehow in the face of all that kind of sublime beauty it was okay I mean that was the one I really felt okay, um, that my life was just this teeny tiny speck and, um, and I was sort of comforted by this geological time. And I think that that sort of that, um, that shift uh, and understanding as, as Ruth King says, you know, life is imperfect, impermanent, impersonal. You know, it's, um, it's Dukkha, it's a Nietzsche, it's a Nada, you know impermanent, um, imperfect, impersonal. And somehow um, making our peace with that, training our body, uh, training to cope with um, our, um, training ourselves to, to cope with even um, fewer material sorts of things. You know, what will we do if resources are, are vastly um, depleted? What are our spiritual resources? You know, mindfulness, compassion, self-compassion. Self-compassion is a big one. And Sangha. And I think that that's one of the ways that we, we train our bodies and, and minds. And just as a little parents here, um, I was reading another article I believe it was in, in Buddha Dharma, but it was Stephanie Kaza, who is um, uh, a Buddhist and um, has just retired from being the head of the environmental studies program in Vermont. 
And Stephanie Kaza said, you know, that one of the things that we should do as sanghas is think about how we want to respond in an emergency. And she talked about being in Portland, um, Portland, uh, Oregon last summer. And she said, you know, Portland experienced this heat dome. They had you know, something like 10 days in which it was more than 100 degrees. And people in Portland, a lot of them don't have air conditioners because Portland is not a place that gets hot. And this heat dome came and people, um, people died, people uh, suffered enormously. And Stephanie said, so are we ready to, you know, turn our, uh, our Dharma centers into cooling stations? Are we ready to mobilize our community to, um, to bring resources and, and aid to other people? Are we ready to uh, really organize as a Sangha and provide care? And I think that's something that's really worth um, investigating, you know, how would we come together as a community to provide some, um, some assistance if our community really did need some, um, uh, was in, in a, a crisis. And the last one of the, um, the maxims is to always act for the future generations of all species that as we're, we're making decisions and acting, that we are acting on behalf of future generations and of not just human beings, but of other, other species. And that, you know, we can speak for those who don't have a, a voice, um, you know, future generations. So often people talk about um, the indigenous practices of, you know, considering seven generations ahead, that thinking about, you know, how is this going to impact seven generations ahead? So we can act, you know, uh, personally and politically to limit damage being done to, um, to the biosphere. And, you know, this is our interconnectedness. So we can act uh, with a sense of solidarity you know, with mutuality and, and reciprocity and um, develop trust by being trustworthy. I mean, that's one way to act on behalf of future generations, to develop trust with each other, to practice trustworthiness. Um, so um, we're asked, not knowing how long any of us will be alive, to live with this understanding that our own death approaches daily. And also, I think that we bear some responsibility for what will happen as we confront the accelerating climate uh, crisis and its consequences for living beings. And that the six maxims offer us um, a way to skillfully relate to a very possible future. So it's work hard to grasp the immensity, cultivate radical hope, have a line in the sand, appreciate the astonishing and unique opportunity, train your body and mind, and act for the generation for the generations of all species, for future generations. And you know, the Buddha taught that suffering comes from um, clinging, and um, our suffering will be exacerbated by clinging to delusions and to fantasy. And um, you know these six maxims are rules of thumb for how we can behave, how we can choose to act, you know, um, sort of now and, and in the future. And all this may seem to be um, a little daunting, if if not overwhelming. So I wanted to end by taking a moment to consider. Um, the Buddha's circumstances at the very end of his life. You know, sometimes in art you see the Parinirvana, the death of the Buddha, and he's um, lying down, and there are all these um, monks and nuns and devas around him, and it's uh, flowers, it's very beautiful, you know, a ton of people um, 
celestial beings and um, it is sometimes presented as, you know, this great culmination of the Buddha's life. But actually, uh, the Buddha was um, 80 years old when he died. He was fleeing. He was heading toward his homeland that, where the Sakyans were, northwest because the two kings that he had befriended in his lifetime, who had bef also befriended him, who had supported him, both of them had been killed by their sons. So their, their sons who were parasites essentially were, were running the two states. Um, the Buddha's own cousin, Devadatta, had recently instigated a schism in the monastic community. He wanted the Buddha to retire. He wanted to take over the community. And he thought the Buddha was not being um, rigorous enough, that he wanted everyone to be Devadatta's, everyone should be a vegetarian. Everyone should uh, sleep only out in the open. Um, very, very ascetic, that the Buddha was not, um, was not sort of um, pushing into enough, enough discipline. And this schism actually resulted in a number of people leaving the community and going off with Devadatta. So there was this schism. Um, and um, shortly before the Buddha's own death, his two foremost disciples, Sariputta and Moggallana, his closest friends, both died. And the story is that Moggallana died very violently. Um, and the Buddha was in very poor health as he was making this journey north. Um, he was accompanied by his cousins, Ananda, his attendant, and Anuruddha, and a very small retinue of monks. He had dismissed most of the monks, said that they needed He needed to find a place for um, most of the monks to spend um, the rains retreat. So he had a very small band with him and he was, he was trying to, um, to go back to, to his homeland. And he was sick and he was in pain and he died likely of food poisoning. And he died in a really undistinguished town, sort of like the boondocks, which was a tremendous embarrassment to his followers that he died in such an undistinguished place. And after the Buddha's death, because there wasn't a clear successor and there was some conflict, a number of monks and some nuns disrobed. Um, and there were struggles for leadership in the Sangha. This was not an auspicious end. This was really pretty grim, actually. And yet, the Dharma endured. And we have the Dharma today. So, you know, this was, um, and I really take heart from that. Um, you know, that, that the, when the Buddha died, um, it was actually um, a very, you know, very difficult circumstances. Uh, and what happened with the Sangha over the next couple of years, there was some, uh, there were some power struggles in it. And, um, you know, it's it's not this this kind of just uh, arc that keeps going going forward and up. So, you know, at the time of the Buddha's death, um, it was it was pretty grim. It wasn't the way it is in in all the religious art about the Buddha's death. Um, so. It may sound a little perverse, but actually, um, I find this um, something, um, I find this comforting 
in a way, as I think of our situation today. Uh, there's a lot that, that is just unknown. And there's a lot that, that seems, um, seems really um, ominous. Um, but the Dharma is there for us, these teachings about working with suffering, relieving suffering, living with integrity, living mindfully, letting go of ill will, letting go of uh, greed, letting go of delusion. And I think that's what, um, that's pretty tangible that we can work with that. And, um, and we, have, we have the example of the Buddha, we have the teachings of the Dharma, and we have Sangha, we have a community. So I offer these, um, these reflections to you tonight as um, I hope as, uh, as an encouragement for us to, um, to really embrace the Dharma and to face this difficult and uncertain future um, with some resolve, um, with mindfulness, with compassion. You know, as I mentioned in the beginning, you know, the, the teachings around suffering essentially are um, the encouragement of, of wisdom and compassion. And that that's what, um, what we can uh, take refuge in, in a way, and cultivate. So thank you for your very kind uh, attention. And, um, and I would be really interested in uh, any, any responses. There might be questions, but also just responses to this. So please feel free to just unmute yourself and, um, and comment. Patrice, I really liked what you added at the end about how Buddha's life ended. That was very sobering. I mean, we, we tend to have some kind of idealized idea of how he might have died and, and the like, and to, to frame it with the kings having died and uh, there being this division within the community and the like, uh, that's kind of a harsh reality. And, and um, that was very sobering to hear just like facing this climate crisis is a harsh reality. And um, I think um, there is something encouraging, I think, to take, pull our heads out of the sand and really look at what's there and face what we're seeing happening all around us. I mean, somehow the idea of facing it and then with some guidance about doing something about it where we can, where we do have agency. We do have agency to be kind to other people. We have agency about controlling our heat. We have agency about certain things and to identify where do we have agency and then act on that is somehow feels freeing and ground and yet grounded. So thank you so much. This was really a um uh, a really fact-filled <laughs> provocative talk thank you so much oh thank you thank you ollie the the idea of sort of having a, a moral advanced directive i thought was a powerful idea yeah. um, wow. other thoughts Um, this is Robert in South Minneapolis, he, him pronouns. Um, I, too, uh, get a lot from your teaching today on the maxims. I think that um, I'm keenly aware, I'm about to enter my eighth decade, and I'm keenly aware 
of the situation we're leaving for those who come behind us. Uh, and certainly as a Afro-Caribbean American, um, it weighs very heavily uh, to see the condition in our, in our major cities around the violence that was often uh, black on black crime, so to speak, or uh, and um, it it's it weighs heavily on me. Uh, having grown up in a different, I grew up in Harlem, and then uh, moved to Queens, where I had much better opportunities in terms of education and being out of the out of Harlem itself. Um, and uh, so I, I thank my grandmother for that. Um, <clears throat> However, it's like I have uh, had several meetings in the last week and week and a half and uh, been with friends over coffee and we've talked about these issues, some of these issues. And we're all very concerned about it. And our, I think in our own life, in our own ways, we're trying to find ways that we can uh, address these issues, at least from our perspective, where we are at this point in our lives. Um, so I thank you very much for, for the maxims. They're just fantastic to hear all that. And this lesson is a is really sober, but just monumentally good teaching. Thank you. Thanks so much, Robert. The other thing I, I, I'll just add is it, it, it's just this whole recalibration of our society. We just had the World Cup, you know, and uh, and what they have to do, create eight air conditioned stadiums in this desert place, you know, uh, to me, it, it just seemed like a gross waste of energy resources and the like, it just, it, you know, and, and and so culturally, it's kind of how can we influence a different set of values of where, <laughs> you know, people spend their money, time and energy. It, it, it's just mind boggling if all that money and energy would have been devoted to helping climate change and the like, you know, things like that. It's just like we, you know, a lot of my people, my friends now are retired, so they're going on these elaborate vacations, which really take up a lot of energy, <laughs> flying all over Europe and all that kind of thing, you know, and it's kind of like, we need to rethink how we spend our life, money, resources, and, and, and the like. You know, it's, yeah, yeah. Anyhow, that was just another thought I had. It's like, we have to recalibrate, and I don't see us doing that. Um, well, changing, you know, second. it may be hard to change individuals' um, behaviors, um, but there are ways of um, you know, changing policies that make things more, more likely, more equitable. Um, you know, and, and I just really um, believe in doing what we can when there's an opportunity to do something to, um, to do it. And, and the, mm -hmm. uh, I also think, you know, no act is too small. So, um, uh, you know, we do, we do what we can. And, um, you know, they're influencing how building codes, um, you know, like a, a city budget um, building codes. Um, I recently was, was actually at a city council meeting where people were testifying about the budget. And um, people talked about how um, the city is having some problems because there are not enough inspectors for buildings. So when there are complaints, and one of the reasons there are not enough inspectors is the city is not willing to pay inspectors what inspectors will get paid in the suburbs. I mean, so I mean, there are just some. Sometimes there's something where there is um, what might seem to be a, a simpler or uh, more obvious 
fix where you know constituents can say you know what we really need we really need more housing inspectors uh, when people have complaints about substandard housing and and uh, if they're renting and so it you know it should be a priority for the city to to do that or um, I have my own list of, <laughs> of issues that are, I will not bring to the table tonight but um, but I do believe that you know we that the idea of agency um, and and that we don't have to you know it doesn't have to be that the biggest thing we can choose some small thing that will make a difference and um, and bring our, our resources to um, to that. It's it's you know deciding where it is that we can um, we can work on on suffering. Um, I just wanted to respond to um, what you said, Ollie, and a little bit what you said, Robert. Um, that I'm I'm in my 20s, so uh, I don't really have a lot of people thinking about kind of this concept of stewardship that I think was an underlying theme in what in what you're saying um, with the lectures. And the only reason why I've had any exposure is because my family is half native Ojibwe, and so we have kind of what you're saying. We have some indigenous values, and that is just woven into our lives um, and it just feels kind of natural, um, but it just doesn't feel natural for at least the American, as far as I can tell, perspective. It's, it's not natural to have a sense of stewardship. And so um, I've found it really difficult to find a community, at least in my generation of people that just kind of hold that as like a truth kind of, or as something that we should be doing. It's very much on, on the back of their minds. Whereas um, I know the way my grandpa grew up, that's one of the first things that you teach young children is how to be a steward of, of their families and of the world around them. So um, I don't know, I guess I'm just expressing a difficulty <laughs> that I have and, and a hope that I have that um, it all kind of leak down into the younger generations eventually. And also thank you so much for the lectures. I really loved them. It's a great way to end the day. <laughs> Thanks. Oh, thank you, Emma. And you know, there, there, it has been like Greta Thunberg. Um, there are um, a number of younger activists that um, are um, that are are working on some of these issues and um i really notice in um the sort of political action groups that i'm in that there are it's either folks who are retired like me or people in their 20s I mean, it's really interesting that this sort of whole middle part um you know there are very few people in their say from 35 to 55 um involved in a lot of the political action groups that I, I work with, but I am really heartened by um, the number of young, um, young activists that I encounter. So I hope, Emma, that you will have the opportunity to come into contact with um, more, pe more people um, who are in their 20s who are really um, engaged and um, so that's that's a a hope. Anything else before we end this evening? I, this is Robert again. I want to mention one thing. Uh, I read uh, an article by uh, Fred Morris. I don't know who he is, but uh, a friend of mine sent me the article, and then we sat for coffee for a few hours talking about this and he the article what struck me about the article is that it said that the United States is 21st of the uh, uh, developed countries that uh, in terms of how it treats elderly and young people and so how we treat our citizens and essentially from birth to death and uh, that's a startling figure 
Uh, and I, I believe it to be true for sure, uh, because I see the the aspects that we deal with around homelessness and around uh, youth being uh, on the streets and so forth. And uh, it's just alarming. Um, it, I do what I can do in my own personal life, and I won't get into that right now, but uh, I'm really, it's so important for us, I feel, for us to be, um, this to be part of our Dharma teaching and our Dharma, um, the way we influence the world around us as well. Thank you, Robert. Well, and, and thank you all for, for being here um, this evening. I really appreciate um, your very kind attention. And I will um, share the merit um, as we go. And um, you know what I love about this, this ritual of sharing the merit is like we can be wildly extravagant with our good wishes. So, um, and that always makes me feel better. So if there's any goodness to our practice, any benefit or blessing or merit, we would happily, gladly, joyfully share it with others. In fact, if we could, we would give it all away. We would give any blessings to our teachers, our parents, our families, our friends, our community. We would share any goodness with the people we like and also with the people we don't like so much. We would share the merit with the people we know and the millions upon millions of people we have yet to know. And in addition to all the two-leggeds, we would share any blessings with the four-leggeds, the many-leggeds, the winged, the scaly, the slimy, the finny. May all beings find a path to peace. May all beings be free from suffering. So have a good night and um, a good new year and be well. Take care. <laughs>